right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. On behalf of a likely story bookstore, Carol Lutheran Village and Carroll County Public Library, welcome to His Majesty's Airship with author S.C. Gwynn. If you enjoy tonight's program, we have many more lined up for you in the next month. Um, that is, is not at all an exaggeration. We'll be hosting James Homey, former director of the FBI, in his fiction debut on Friday, June the 2nd. Tickets are on sale now at Carroll Art Center's website. You'll also get a signed copy of his new book, Central Park West, which is a gripping and fast-paced legal thriller inspired by Comey's long career in federal law enforcement, including his years in Manhattan as a mob prosecutor and later the chief federal prosecutor. He takes the reader deep inside the world of lawyers and investigators working to solve a murder mystery while navigating the treacherous currents of modern politics and the mob. Get your tickets now before it sells out. Tonight's program will include an interview with Ted Zaleski, one half of the two sides to the story podcast. Ted is also Carroll County's Director of Management and Budget, but we all know he is also an avid reader and secretly, or not so secretly, <laughs> would prefer to be a librarian or bookseller. <laughs> Check out the two sides to the story podcast online or through your Apple or Spotify podcast apps. S.C. Sam Gwynn is the author of two acclaimed books on American history, Empire of the Summer Moon, which spent 82 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, which is nothing to sneeze at, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. It also won the Texas and Oklahoma Book Prizes <coughs> and Rebel Yell, The Violence, The Passion, and Redemption of Stonewall Jackson, which was published in September 2014. It was also a New York Times bestseller and was named a finalist for both the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Pl Penn Literary Award for Biography. His book, The Perfect Pass, American Genius, and the Reinvention of Football, was published in September 2016 and was named to a number of top 10 sports books lists. We are delighted to have Sam with us tonight. So please join me in giving a hearty welcome to S.C. Gwynn. Do you want to say anything first? Uh, no, you go ahead. OK. Well, yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> a very friendly guy. <laughs> yeah, I was beforehand walking from the back of the room up here and realized I was watching myself on the screen up there. I didn't realize that no, I was going to be so big on the wall here. So uh, Lisa mentioned. How you know how Taylor Swift feels? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Without all of her money, though. <laughs> uh, Lisa mentioned um, the podcast. My partner Lori Hirstetter is not with me here today, going going solo. If any of you are interested in checking us out and you don't know about it yet, I do have business cards that have our website so you can find us. So, His Majesty's Airship. I have more questions than we're gonna have time for. And I'm very open to the order that I end up doing these questions depending on where our conversation goes. We'll, we'll see, see what happens. So I, I had somebody I was talking to about doing this interview say, so what's your quick summary of this book? And I said, ignoring science and chasing dreams leads to disaster. Very good. <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> All right, already a successful interview. <laughs> so uh, first thing, the title, His Majesty's Airship. I really wonder, there's, other than an idea of British imperialism, which I think we'll come back to, the king plays no part in, the, in this, this book, and there are other people who play much more prominent places. How, why did it end up being His Majesty's Airship? Oh, just because that's just the, the formal title. I mean, it's, it's just his 
His Majesty's, Her Majesty's, that's just what these things were called. Okay. Uh, HMA. I mean, it, it's literally just what it was called. But it, it also, um, it also. I mean, I, I use the word because it was, in fact, a British government project. Um, it wasn't run by the king, but it was run by the air ministry, which is in the cabinet. And uh, uh, I guess I wanted to convey that this was, uh, you know, like not Joe's airship, <laughs> you know, which it, there have been some of those. But this was... And so much of the book, as you say, is is about empire and the British Empire and the and the way this the technology and history sort of flowed through the empire. And I wanted to suggest that too. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense. This this was not a a private effort. This was very very tied to English ambition. As, as long as we're there, maybe we should talk about that now. You know, uh, two really big ideas are nationalism and imperialism as realized through these airships. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can frame this because a lot of you guys don't really know what this is, book is about yet. Um, so nationalism, let's talk about nationalism and imperialism. When Great Britain came out of World War I, it was a, a power in decline. It also suddenly held 25% of the world's land mass and 400 million people, the largest empire the world had ever known. Uh, and so here we have a kind of a country that's a bit in decline and would continue to decline and as the American star rose uh, in, in the, in the uh, 20th century. But um, so, so sometime in the mid-20s, a, a scheme was evolved by the men of empire, the men of the declining empire. They still had a huge empire. They, a scheme was evolved to basically link the far-flung parts of the British Empire, so imagine New Zealand or imagine South Africa or Australia or Singapore or India or Egypt or Canada, all pieces, dominions, territories, whatever, of the British Empire. And the scheme called the Imperial Airship Scheme was going to link these things together globally. And it was going to be kind of a, a, a new way to look at the empire. And, and it, because of what, it, what they wanted, they wanted the thing they wanted to use to do this was were the air, were airships, which back then were considered to be as good a bet for long-range travel as airplanes were. So they were going to populate the skies with these things. And just to give you an example of the advantages conveyed, so Australia to England was the better part of a month to travel. On an airship, it was 11 days. You know, India was two weeks to four days. So by linking all this together, um, by linking the empire, you're, you're not only compressing time, you're compressing space, right? Because it, 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 the empire becomes smaller. And, it, and th the last thing they wanted to do, and this gets right at nationalism, was this sense of British, um, you know, what was going to be filling the skies were going to be these magnificent 700-foot airships carrying people and men all over the place and women and everybody all over the place. But it was going to be British technology that was going to do it. Uh, British technology that was a bit embarrassed in World War One, uh, and British. If we go back to the height of the British Empire, you know it was built on the kind of the, 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 the greased piston, these these engines that the British built that nobody else could build, and the ships that they built that nobody else could build with guns that nobody else could build. It was the empire, the, the world's greatest empire, you know, which was at its height in the 19th century. This was going away. So this was a plan or a scheme that kind of fit with a new idea of empire. And so this is, there's a lot of other things going on here, but this is kind of the big picture. And, and moreover, it is one man is pushing this. We'll get to Lord Thompson later, but Lord Christopher Thompson is the man who was pushing this scheme. I, I went on a little bit, but. No, that's good. <laughs> trying to set the stage. Yes. And uh, as you pointed out, we haven't really said what this is, is about. So we're going to get into a little bit more detail about what's going on in this book. But um, yes, uh, you mentioned India. We will get back to India because it plays a pivotal role in what happens here. And Lord Thompson, you mentioned, uh, is also, you can't pull him apart from this story and you can't pull him apart from India in, in this story. So I would guess most people in the audience know about the Goodyear blimp you probably know about the Zeppelin Hindenburg, but I'm guessing there aren't very many people in the audience, if you haven't read this book, who know much more beyond that about this idea of airships. 
and we're going to talk about some some things that I didn't know about, and I really found myself when I was reading this book saying, how did I not know about this? How have I never heard about, about this? Now, um, one thing we talk about the Hindenburg, almost everybody knows about the Hindenburg, but they don't know about R-101. Why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, it's interesting, just for background, so R-100, uh, Hindenburg went down in 1937 in a fireball that you all have seen, and I've seen, and everybody alive has probably seen it. R-101 went down, and I'm not spoiling anything here, it's on the cover of my book, The Life and Tragic Death, okay, I'm not spoiling. Uh, it, it went down 1930, seven years before the Hindenburg. It was more lethal. Uh, it's a much better story, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, the Hindenburg, uh, really the only thing good, interesting about the Hindenburg was what caused the boom. This is a much more complex um, story. And it also has the advantage, as you say, of being almost entirely unknown. Um, I think the reason, th there's, there's a, a number of reasons why I think that the kind of airship saga was which lasted for 40 years, 1900, 1940, basically. It was overwritten historically by other things. The Hindenburg was one of the things that overwrote it, I think. I mean, everybody knows about the Hindenburg, but you know, there were more than 50 Zeppelins that went up in hydrogen fireballs during World War I. Nobody knows that. Um, and, and so there was an overwrite going on there. There was also, I think, an overwrite going on uh, you know, just by the, the ascendancy of the airplane. Uh, for example, there was a in 1919, there was a British uh, airship that crossed the Atlantic, first crossing ever east to west, a big deal. I mean, these guys were heroic. They almost died 10 times. Um, wha you guys, have n I guarantee you've never heard of R-34, the British airship. No. And it was the third one to do a, a double crossing uh, of, of the Atlantic. And wh why? Well, in 1927, something else happened. This guy Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, and, and, and it was an incredible feat, but it... it Again, it, I use the word overwrite, it, 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 it overwrote, I think, the heroic exploits to say R-34. Um, and I think also that, uh, that maybe to some extent, uh, you know, the first long range bombers were Zeppelins and they bombed Europe, seven cities in Europe and they bombed London, they bombed everything. I, I, they weren't, I mean, I think people might think that if you let's say you think of London and you're going to think of World War being bombed by the Germans in World War II, um, there was so much bombing going on in European cities. But this actually dates to World War One. Again, I think the Second World War maybe overshadows it a little bit. But um, but it, anyway, it's it's a, it's a wonderful saga. It's great. It's neat. It starts in 1900 and it ends in 1939, and that's it. And it was a well, it, whatever. How did you describe it? It was a terrible idea. It was like an absolutely terrible. Uh, airships were these particular types of airships were bad ideas, and they lasted a little longer than they probably should have. So, um, when you say people know about the Hindenburg, I think an another thing in the mix here is that was caught on film and on the radio, whereas R101 was not. That's a really good point, and I should have brought that up. That the, the see all those those 50 plus German Zeppelins that went down. You know, many of them shot down by British fighter planes. Uh, there's, uh, there's only film of one, a picture, it's a silent, it's a still picture of one that I know of. So nobody saw it, and it's really quite spectacular. And when R101 went up, it looked just like the Hindenburg, as did, uh, you know, at some point over London in 1916, there were Zeppelins falling from 18,000 feet, and I mean, it was good, it was a good show. And very satisfying if you were a British fighter pilot to shoot, to shoot one of these things down. Um, but it, it uh, and, and I'll tell you one, one interesting little story about that because it's so much the way we know, uh, we know about Zeppelins. Uh, so in 1937, when, when the Hindenburg went down, there was, a, uh, there was a guy from a company called Pathé there and he was filming it. Um, and it was a silent film. And that film played in every movie theater in America, which is why everybody knows about it, silently, because there was no sound with it at all. It was just this 30 seconds, like the most amazing 30 seconds that anybody ever saw, was the Hindenburg. So sometime in the 60s, some enterprising British producer, oh, and I'm sorry, at the same time, there was a guy there from the AP 
right, who was going, oh, the humanity, oh, look, it's going, you know, that voice that we've all heard before, right? Okay, so sometime in the 60s, uh, I think, or the late 50s, a British producer married the two. Enterprising guy put the sound with the film, and so we get what we all saw, which, again, one of the most famous events in, in history. Uh, and, and uh, I mean, how many events do we all know like that that, that involve aviation? Probably not very many. Now, I guess that, that radio announcer saying, oh, the humanity, I, I have to think that, you know, if you put together the top 10 things that people remember hearing, that's probably in there somewhere. So uh, you talked about the 50 Zeppelins that went down, and I'm hoping we'll get back to this a little bit later. But uh, an important idea here is there was, a, in that 40 years you're talking about, there was a long string of failures and disasters. You know, one of the really interesting things in here is how people kept convincing themselves that it wasn't a problem. But So I mentioned the Goodyear blimp, which isn't a blimp. We've talked about Zeppelins. There's, um, and we've talked about airships, and there's another term that comes up, dirigible. Uh, can you talk a little bit about blimp versus yeah, I, dirigible versus zeppelin versus yeah, yeah, airship? Because yes. uh, when I first was starting, when I first was thinking about doing this book, I told something to my wife. I said, I, I told Katie, you know, I said, uh, I said, well, you know, I do a book about this airship, and and she looks at me with this deadpan. She goes, she says, you're going to do a book about a blimp? She said, you know thinking of the Goodyear blimp, it's like, you know, maybe, the, but so uh, to, to define uh, what R101 or Hindenburg was, they are rigid airships. They are not balloons and they are not blimps. So a little bit of history, if we go back, balloons were invented in the 18th century and they were a great idea. You could be fill them with gas or hot air, or hydrogen gas or hot air, and they went up, which in a world governed by gravity was a miracle, right? And everything else, I'm sorry, goes that way. This thing went up. The problem with the balloon was you couldn't steer it. It went where God or the wind wanted it to go. I mean, it, you, you couldn't. It, you could tether it to the ground and use it as a military balloon, but that's an uh, observation balloon. So in the 19th century, um, the French invented a way to like put a rudder on it and a propeller, and uh, thus, uh, thus making a, a balloon that you could fly, sort of, kind of. And the French. Um, verb for to steer or direct is diriger. And so something that was steerable wa uh, was dirigeable, dirigible, a steerable balloon. Um, anyway, but what there, th there was this really interesting guy named Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. He had the, like the world's greatest walrus mustache, a, a German nobleman. In 1900, he invented the rigid airship. And the rigid airship was looks like what you would think the Hindenburg did, or if you when you see my book here, this that is a rigid airship. What he did is he figured out that the problem with balloons and a blimp is just a kind of a balloon. It's not a, it's not a hard steel structure. It's inflated. Is that they tended to collapse upon themselves, and therefore you, they can only lift so much. You know, a balloon can only lift. You know, say a child's helium balloon could you know only lift that toothpick. It can't lift any more than that. If you had a balloon 20 times the size, it could probably lift a wagon. You know, so that was that was the problem with the, with balloons. They they didn't. I mean, with balloons and blimps, they could only lift so much. So he invents this steel structure, enormous, gigantic steel structure. These things were 500 feet long when he invented them, four or 500 feet long, and inside this hard steel structure of girders and transverse frames were these gigantic gas bags, some of which were three, four, five, ten stories high. And because of that, they had lift, tremendous amount of lift. And that, and so a Zeppelin, which is a word that entered the English language in the early 20th century because it was invented by Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, um, become, became the prototype of this new machine. These are rigid airships, and that, and that is the difference. And so when we say R101, what does the R stand for? Rigid. Is that, does that answer the question? Yes. Because it's, it's, uh, it's not immediately apparent what, what one is. And they don't exist anymore. You can't find one. Uh, when, you hear, when you hear somebody going up in an airship, you're looking at a blimp, a version of a blimp. And uh, Von Zeppelin was an interesting guy. He went from being this trying to make things happen bit of a joke to many people to suddenly having a global monopoly on, on these airships. 
So um, we've talked about big, but I want to give you an idea of just how big we're talking about. I roughly paced off the size of this room when I came in here today, and R101 was the length of this room seven times. Going across the balloon was twice the size of, of this room. We're talking about really, really big. <laughs> And yeah, uh, it, it aspects the size of this room. Yes, I mean not quite so high, but it, as big. Yeah, and actually, they're they're described in the book as um, ten-story big cheese wheels. <laughs> That's what they look like. So imagine that. You know, we're talking about you know a hundred a hundred feet of gas bag. I was going to come to this a little bit later, but since uh, gas bags came up, and also incredibly fragile. Um, Maybe you can tell people what they made these gas bags out of and just how easy they were to damage. Okay, so one of the problems with this idea, that there were all kinds of problems with the airship idea. There was, you know, the fact that you had, in this case, six acres of, of surface area in a 50 mile an hour wind. They just it did what it wanted to. You had different types of problems, but one of the core problems of the rigid airships was that they were, even though they had a steel structure, they were, everything else was really flimsy. So. They, they were covered with cloth, thin cotton cloth. But they, they put dope on it, which is a type of airplane, like var celluloid varnish or something on there to, to make it waterproof. But it was still a thin drape of cotton over this thing that is, I think, 777 feet long, right? Um, inside, th the gas bags were made from something called gold beater skins, which was, um, which was a name for the intestines of cattle that were taken from slaughterhouses and cured, they would scrape the blood and the mucus and the slime off them and then they would cure them and then they would kind of glue them together into these things. So you have in this, R101 had a 10 story, this middle gas bag was 10 stories high. So what's that? Three maybe? Just now imagine seven more stories, that's the size, and it's made out of these cattle intestines that are backed with a very thin layer of cotton. Now why would you do that? Why would you use cattle intestines? In fact, they, they used 500,000 of them that were shipped from Argentina, slaughterhouses in Argentina. I know this seems implausible, but I'm not making it up. The reason that they used um, these things is because they couldn't, in all of their scientific genius, figure out anything that was as impermeable as these animal intestines. And, and think of a sausage casing. That's what it was, a sausage casing, from the, this, in this case from the cecum of a cow. Uh, it was the only thing. And they tried for years to improve on it. A good year eventually got something that was better, but for years and years and years. So the, uh, you had th these, uh, these women in the, in the factories north of London were, were building these massive, so you, you had to glue them together and and the whole room stunk of the, because it was, you're, you're dealing with offal, basically. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, so you had gas bags that were, e if you drop a tool, it would go through it. You could put your finger through it. Workers were constantly falling through and out the other side. So a very thin cotton wrap over the whole thing, protecting something the thickness of a membrane. Uh, and, and so they were, you know, at the one, at, because they had steel structures that were pretty strong, um, they were, uh, they were strong in that sense, and they were unbelievably fragile in another sense. So uh, still on the idea of size, you mentioned six acres. So the, the skin of this airship, six acres. And um, I, I went and looked this up because I wasn't sure how to, how to think about an acre. A football field is approximately an acre. There you go. So you have six football fields wrapping the, this airship. And then one other size thing that I, I thought was really good, the largest ocean liner at that time was the um, SS Leviathan. And the volume of R101 was twice that of the world's largest ocean liner. Uh, it, it's just, uh, for me at least, mind boggling thinking, thinking about the size of, of this. I mean, people couldn't believe it when they saw it. When she flew over, Lo when R101 flew over London, I mean, people just came out and went, 
a she, I mean, she came in low, like six, 700 feet. People simply couldn't believe, I mean, in the age, what they were looking at. There was nothing else on Earth that was that big. So some of you might be thinking, so what do you do with this thing? <laughs> Where does it stay? And there were also huge buildings that these airships would stay in, but when you took them outside, you still had to do something with them. So they had these mooring masts, uh, a big structure where this airship hanging in the air is, is attached. And one of the problems we'll come to later is there weren't very many of these mooring masts. Uh, it's not like finding a place to park. You know, you, uh, there weren't many choices. And I'll give you a sense of size again. A, a mooring mast for R101 would have been about 200 feet high. And the base of the mast was about the size of this room. Again, very, very big. And getting out of a building to a mooring, mooring mast, I, I believe you, you said there were about, you needed about 400 people yes. to move one of these things. And that's when there was no wind. And one of the biggest problems here is where you, if, you, if it, you could get it inside of its shed, it was safe. Uh, except for the fact that there were a number of hydrogen fires inside the sheds. But other than it, there, it was safe from wind. But these things were terribly vulnerable to wind. And uh, as a result, that if you, if you, even if you had 400 people on it and you had a sudden 20 knot gust of wind, that thing was going where it was going. And so there were all these hydrogen uh, filled uh, rigid airships that just got beaten to pieces on the ground. And which brings up the, one of their most interesting characteristics, and it has to do with the mast. You say, well, okay, if it can get to the mast, at least it can tie up to the mast. The problem is, is that an airship up in a storm cannot go down. It's impossible for it to go down because if it comes near the earth at the length of six, seven, eight hundred feet, it's just going to be pounded to little pieces. And that's what happens. And, and not only if it's filled with hydrogen, somewhere along the line there, it's going to catch fire and then, and then go up that way too. But imagine, so, okay, a ship in a storm can go into a port. Uh, a plane can land, right, on a strip or a field or a road or somewhere. The airship couldn't, and there, there was an amazing moment. This was in... Uh, three years after the R101 went down, uh, and a few years, three years, four years before the Hindenburg went down, there was American airship Shenandoah, I'm sorry, American airship um, uh, Akron, uh, was caught in a kind of a circle of thunderstorms off the Jer New Jersey coast. And there was just this tragic kind of, the, th the, the crew fled from one to another. I mean, went, went offshore and lightning and thunder came, and thunder and lightning, of course. Imagine what an updraft does with something that's 800 feet long. It just takes it up to 4,000 feet and then drops it down again and then tail stands it up on one, and that's what happens to them. So these thunders, they're fleeing to the west, fleeing to the east, fleeing to the south. They can't get out. Finally, they hit a, a, a wicked downdraft that just puts them down. And this is a helium balloon, by the way, that everybody thought was safe. Anyway, the Akron goes down into the... Uh, 39 degree water of the Atlantic Ocean and 73 to 76 die. But that happened because the airship could not land. And this is one of the fundamental problems with this whole I idea. You know, that we can't get out of these storms idea uh, aside. If you're in bad weather, airships have, they have no options. They're, you, you can't land. Because when, when you have, have the winds, there's no way to get down to the ground, like, like you were saying. Uh, there, and with, I talked about the mooring mass. There are very few options. It's not like, well, we can't land here, so let's go to another one. So you have this situation where in a bad, uh, a bad situation, um, there, there are no options. There's nothing to do. Really the only... What the Germans learned to do, and the Germans could fly airships like nobody else could. I mean, for all their problems, they, they knew how to do it. Their only solution to it was what uh, this great airship captain, German airship captain, uh, Hugo Eckener, called free ballooning. He just, just let it go. Just make sure you've got your ship in equilibrium, take it up to a couple thousand feet, and just let it go. 
And if you're going to get blown across the North Sea or the Mediterranean, at least you, you're not trying to go down. Uh, now, that doesn't guarantee your safety, but it, at least it at least it's better than fighting the wind. Um, and he did that successfully sometimes. But imagine how scary that is to be in something that you just can't, you can't go down. Yeah, so your best option is, all right, let's go wherever we happen to go. Right, go back, in fact, go back to the original balloon, which went up and who knows where it was going to go. Free ballooning over whatever. So, uh, and if you're trying to picture the, the mooring mast, um, if you think about looking at kind of the skeleton of a lighthouse or maybe looking at the Eiffel Tower, you get some sense of what a mooring mast would look like. Now, your chapter titles interested me, and I think if, if you don't want to put the time into reading the book, you could probably read the chapter titles and get a pretty good sense of what's going on. Some of the titles, this isn't all of them, but Dreams, Pipe Dreams, and Imperial Visions, Brief History of a Bad Idea, Flying Death Trap, The Idea That Would Not Die, The Perfectly Safe Prototype, which is sarcasm, Fools Rush In, and A Very Violent End. There you go. <laughs> well, it's a book about a crash. <laughs> it's a book about a bad idea that somehow, as you suggested, persisted for, I mean, it's a book about, as you correctly, it's a book about human folly, but human folly on a very high and sophisticated level. I mean, um, anyway, sorry, go on. So you've mentioned hydrogen and helium. Let's talk a little bit more about the two gases, why one versus the other, and not to give away the story, but what does it look like when an airship burns and explodes? The best, the, the, the record that we have is, is the Hindenburg, you know, and that's, that's the record, that's what it looks like. It's hydrogen will, uh, is very volatile and will explode if you hit it with a match just the hydrogen, and when you mix it with air, it gets worse. And if you mix it with air inside a, uh, an airship's envelope, that something that big, again, the volume, the size of the Titanic, uh, you're gonna get m massive uh, explosions. And it was interesting how for, for a long time they tried to kind of deny the fact that hydrogen was dangerous. It was like, well, it's not really dangerous, or it's only dangerous when this, that, and the other. And uh, in fact, it was dangerous, and when the Hindenburg went down, and by the way, my book isn't about the Hindenburg, so I hope you're going to But when it did go down, the, the uh, uh, you know, after it went down, the Germans kept saying, you know, everything was put, noth there was nothing wrong. When we were landing in New Jersey that day, everything was perfect, nothing was wrong, like this, you know, it, which of course, if somebody's saying that to you, you'd say, well, I'm certainly not getting on one of those, if that's what perfect looks like, if you can't figure out what went wrong with it. I don't I'm not gonna do that, but the interesting thing about helium, so helium is a less efficient lifting gas, significantly less, I mean, in some cases, 50% less, but it, it works. I mean, we all know what helium is, right? Uh, and it's very, oh, actually, there's an interesting, so one of the reasons I know what helium is is from childhood, childhood birthday parties, right? <laughs> you, you inhaled it and you talk like Minnie Mouse, right? That's helium. And one of the interesting side notes, and I'll try to get back to the main thing, is that when, when, they were, when the men were working with the giant hydrogen gas bags up in the rafters, um, they whistled or sung the whole time. Because hydrogen was also a very light element, like helium, hydrogen is the lightest element. It's number one. Uh, if, if, if there was, hy and hydrogen would just kill you like that, would asphyxiate you like that if you, if you suddenly had a big leak. But if you were whistling or singing and your voice went to Minnie Mouse, you needed to get the hell out of there. Um, that was what they did. Um, but anyway, back to helium very quickly. Uh, helium was something that really occurred in the United States of America, Texas Panhandle and Kansas. I mean, that's, that's mostly where it, where it is. Um, I've, al I've, I've had often had like a sort of a, an amusing vision of what, w what the people in the helium mine sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so we, we had it, and the Germans wanted it, and the Germans tried to get it, and as time went by, it became, it was it considered more and more a strategic element that we did not want to share with, with the, the Germans. And uh, uh, when, when Ugo Eckener built the Hindenburg, he wanted that absolutely to be a helium airship, and we wouldn't give him, we're approaching World War II now, he wouldn't, we wouldn't give him the helium. So he convinced himself again, well, hydrogen really isn't all that bad. 
you know, and if, well, of course, you can see the video, the Hindenburg, but in a lesser way, uh, you can Google uh, balloon catching fire and exploding. There's videos out there, and you can see with just a regular balloon like you would know what it looks like. And it, it's exactly the same thing as what happened just on the, with the airships on a much greater scale. So we're talking about a lot of problems with airships. They burn and explode. They're fragile. They can't handle weather. You need a lot of people to deal with them. But Germany and then England and then the United States for decades closed their eyes, ignored this, convinced themselves that it wasn't a problem. You know, how, how could that be? I think it's going back to the question of nationalism. I think, you know, why did these things persist when they were, uh, in retrospect, clearly a bad idea? I think there was a higher tolerance for risk back then in war. I mean, there was, there was you know, if you were looking at aviation back then, air sh airplanes crashed a lot too. There was a lot of death going on there. And as, as technology improved, there was, vi you know, there, there was a lot of sacrifice and and th that went on, and there was certainly the, the kind of levels of risk that people became comfortable with um, in the war. But uh, so, so the first wave, really, of German airships, G Germany ran a, a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a fake airline for a few years before the war. Fake in the sense that they claimed it was an air airliner running on schedule that actually was running only in fair weather, only with light winds, uh, only short hop, only in summer. You know, I mean, it was that it wasn't it wasn't a real commercial airline. But they kind of they, they did it in order to get money. And the reason they wanted to get money is because von Zeppelin's original concept here, uh, the reason he wanted a a large airship that could lift a lot was he wanted a weapon of war. That was it was. It was never anything but a weapon of war. That's what it was. He never saw it as an airline. He never saw it as a p passenger carrying. Never saw it as these were ancillary things. These were things he kind of did before the war to get the money. So when the Zeppelins were launched in World War I, and there were a lot of them, you know, launched against, uh, against Europe, this was the first. This was kind of hyper-nationalism. This was Germany Germany being Germany, right? They're, they're, they were up. They, they had better better Zeppelin technology than anybody. In fact, nobody could touch them. And they knew this. And there was a lot of kind of, you know, fatherland, you know, we're, uh, we, I mean, Germany was conquest oriented. Uh, when we come out of the war, um, great Germany now is completely hamstrung. I mean, all their sh airships are given away because, you know, they we're going to punish the Germans after the war at the Treaty of Versailles. And, uh, uh, and so at this point, uh, Great Britain sort of steps in. And now with they, they in their own kind of nationalistic sense of, you know, we want to build, we want the empire to be what it was, they're going to build airships and they're going to actually outdo the Germans. And there was a lot of that in the 20s, this sense that we can, we can build airships better than they can. And, of course, by the, at the end of the war, they were years behind. And the only airships they built during the war, which never became operational, were bad copies of downed Zeppelins. Um, but there, so in both cases, it's it's kind of this sense of national pride, and 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 uh, in, in with Britain after the war, it was that you know we are going to have technology that someone else does. We're going to no one else does. We're going to use material science that nobody else has. We're going to put diesel engines up in R101. Nobody had ever put a diesel in the air before. I mean, we're just going to be a technological leader, and and if you look back, you would say that that's a, it, it's a silly idea because. You, the problems that these things had didn't, didn't go away. One of the things about airplanes is that as time went by, the problems were solved. You know, wing loading, uh, the problems of just safety, the, uh, the problems of how high how high you could fly, how many people you could put in the aircraft. You know, airplanes. You know, the the, the curve goes like this in terms of technological advance, amount of weight carried, safety, engine uh, uh, advances. The, the airships kind of are, are frozen because they, they, were n they, were, they were not able to evolve from what they were. They were unable to escape the things that we've been talking about. And, and on that point, at the time, it seems obvious to us now, but at the time there were a lot of people who thought that airships were the better path, that airplanes were these things that were, were difficult and troublesome and 
dangerous and didn't see the, the lines that you're talking about where they're going to diverge. It's true, and also air airplanes just need a constant refueling, which is, you know, if you go to India, it's 22 stops. You know, airship makes one stop. Big difference. So, kind of tied to what you're talking about there, you know, the, the Germans started this. They're the ones who made it happen. Then the British wanted to get in on it. And another place where arguably they just closed their eyes to reality was their lack of experience and, and lack of, of knowledge. They didn't really know what they were doing and they didn't have people that knew what they were doing flying. You know, on the flying part, you, know, you say that there, um, at the time of R101, uh, British pilots had 3,000 hours of experience against 50,000 for the Germans. Yeah, it wasn't even close because in spite of the, you know, the Germans in the war had, the, the, the Zeppelins were, were, were not efficient bombers. They got lost. They, you know, they got shot down by British um, fighter planes. But there was a lot of experience gained in how to fly one of those things. And there were a lot of pilots and people out there. And when the, when the Germans came out of the war, they had cr these crews that, Really, they were like the 1927 Yankees. I mean, they were they were uh, they were just better than anybody else. And what the really, the only way you had a chance flying an airship was with that sort of that very high level of expertise. And the British never had it, and the Americans never had it either. And both had major crashes. Yeah. Now, something we've kind of touched on, but haven't explicitly gone to, is the idea of size and lift, how, how big your Zeppelin is makes a big difference to how much you can carry. You want to talk about that some? Yeah. Uh, so lift is what it's all about. So if you have 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen gas, which R101 had, the largest by f double by volume that anything else had before it, you can lift a lot. I mean, you can lift uh, 100 people. You can lift... Um, a certain amount of cargo and mail. Uh, you can uh, obviously you're going to have to lift that structure, that huge steel structure, and all the tubing that's inside. And R101 weighed about 110 tons or something like that, and that was without the people on it. So add the 100 people with the cargo, with the uh, bags and so forth. And but that's essentially what. That's how much 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen could lift, um, and. If you were von Zeppelin and you saw it, well, that was more bombs that you could carry. That was his, his version of the way. Uh, he always saw it that way. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was, that was what the game was all about, was, was lift and how much you could lift. And, and in the long run, if you were really going to have commercial services, which is what they saw in the long run, running to literally India and back all the time, New York and back all the time, you know, uh, Australia and back, Singapore and back, this is what they envisioned. They were going to do this. If you're going to have that, you had to have a lot of lift because you couldn't make money if you didn't. I mean, you you, you had to be able to lift a certain amount of cargo um, and you had to be able to lift a certain amount of passengers just to make it economically viable, which, by the way, airplanes after the Lindbergh miracle were just making annual strides. I mean, just thousands of commercial flights in, uh, from everywhere from Australia to France to the United States. Commercial flights were rising at an amazing rate while the airships essentially were stalled. Now, if I'm remembering right, there, there was something like a three-foot increase in diameter added three tons, tons. Three tons of, of lift. So it didn't take making it a lot bigger to, to make a noticeable difference in how much you could carry. And if you went from, you know, a 500-foot, a 100 foot to cross to 777 and 130. That was a big deal. And, and just one note, they were working on 10 million cubic feet airships at the time R101 went down. They had decided, they said, actually, you know, we really need a lot more to make money. So imagine something, I don't know what it would have been, 1,100 feet long and 300 feet high. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not imaginable. seeing the time is going by and realizing, not that I didn't know I wasn't going to get all my questions in, but I'm trying to figure out which ones to it's get that in. The now. author went too long with his answer. No, well, they're they're here to hear you, so <laughs> that's 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 good. Uh, 
Another thing we've kind of touched on, but I think it's worth maybe talking a little bit more about is the complexity of flying the, these things. And I, I started making a list of the things could, that could affect how you fly an airship. You know, airspeed and direction, rain, which adds weight to the, to the airship, what altitude you're at, how much you weigh, movement of the weight in the airship, uh, how much lift you have, lift doesn't remain constant as you're flying, superheating and supercooling, the fuel you've used up, uh, if you get rid of ballast. And one thing I thought was really, really interesting, if an airship is flying at 60 miles an hour, the, the weather that it encounters at the nose takes nine seconds to get to, to the tail, which can actually change how the airship is flying. So I, I, I gave you the list, maybe you can uh, take, go from there and illustrate some of the things they had to deal with. Yeah, so that's a really good summary, by the way, of, of the problems. It, uh, airships were far f harder to fly than airplanes, way harder. And a lot, of, a lot of that had to do with the questions of lift. So, right, so heat, so if you were on a, 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 a cold day with low humidity, you had a lot of lift. If you had a hot day with uh, a lot of humidity, you might less set, lose seven tons of lift. If it rained, you might get add eight tons of weight. As you motored forward and burned gasoline, uh, R101 going to India would, would have burned like 21 tons, would be 21 tons lighter. So it's this constant battle with air temperature and density and pressure and up and down and trying to monitor and keep your, and, uh, and as Ted said, you know, you had the back and, you know, if you had too many people in the stern, it would go like this. And, and when, when uh, sometimes when these air currents hit the bow, that you, you'd suddenly have a, a tail stand at 4,000 feet followed by a nose stand at 1,000 feet. Um, they were very, very hard to fly, and, and the Germans were the only ones who really ever mastered it, and they really knew how to do it, and they had to take into account all the things that you listed. I'm thinking we're not too far away from Lisa saying, okay, it's time to stop. So I want to make sure we get at least two things still, still in here. We talked about, not, we didn't talk about him, we mentioned Lord Thompson way, way back in the beginning and didn't get, get to him. I, th I think we need to talk about him and, and his, his visions. And I want to provide one detail about Lord Thompson before you talk about him. They're loading up R101 for a trip. Lord Thompson brings a 2,600 square foot carpet that weighs more than 1,000 pounds. Remember, we're really worried about weight and lift. And he brings a 1,000 pound carpet with him. His personal luggage weighs 254 pounds. The luggage of the entire crew weighs 350 pounds. I think this tells you something about this guy. Thompson, so this is good that you bring this up because the book really is, it's, it's, it's about the Imperial Airship Scheme and it's about, uh, you know, uh, uh, R101 and, and how she was built and how she crashed and so forth. And it is very much about that. But it's also, it's a human story. It's the story of Lord Thompson, who's the visionary. And Lord Thompson has these flaws, one of which was that one. But uh, he, so in, in, in effect, what, what happens at the end is, is, is uh, really this one man is pushing, pushing these, uh, whether R101 and, one and, his, and his sister ship, to completion at a rate that they should never have been pushed to completion at. And R101, so there was this moment in the book where, where um, Tha Lord Thompson, who's actually a very talented and interesting guy, he's the Secretary of State for Air, you know, he's the best friend of the British Prime Minister, uh, Ramsay MacDonald, but um, <coughs> uh, there's this point where he has decided that what he wants to do, what he really wants to do more than anything, uh, again, he's, he's a child, he grew up in India, a child of five generations of the Raj, I mean, he's a big deal. What he really wants to do he wants to fly R101 to India, and he wants to fly it back. That's 10,000 miles round trip. He's going to prove everybody wrong. These things are safe. They could travel long distances, and he's going to do this, but he needs to be back in time for the Imperial Conference in London where all the grandees from Empire are there, from the dominions and territories, and everybody's going to be at this huge conference, and Thompson's going to step off his airship, having gone 10,000 miles, trailing clouds of glory, march into the Imperial Conference and deliver the lecture on the future of airships, which, by the way, will get him funding for the 10 million cubic foot airships or the 7 million cubic foot airships that he wants. And 
so you have, and, and there's, a, there's another reason, it, there's always a woman somewhere, right? So there's, there, there's this, when Thompson was in a, the British attache in Romania in World War I, uh, he fell in love with this kind of fairy tale princess named Martha Bibesco. And Martha Bibesco, you know, was immensely wealthy, one of the most beautiful women in Europe. Uh, she had two palaces. Um, she was the toast of literary Paris, which is implausible, but she was. She was Marcel Proust wrote her poems. I mean, she wrote books and were, were very celebrated books. And André Gide and Jean Cocteau were, were admirers. And um, Thompson fell head, in, uh, head over heels in love with her, although she at the time, was, she was having fair affairs with various uh, you know, princely millionaires in Europe at the time. And he kind of this, this theme develops where Thompson's trying to impress her. You know, it's like the reason like boys start garage bands, right, to impress girls. I mean, in this case, Thompson wants to go to India <laughs> to do it. But it becomes, but India becomes wound with his destiny. Not only is he from India and he's from the Raj there, not only does he want War 101 to do this so that the future of the, of, of the world can be uh, populated with airships in the sky, but he also, with the girlfriend in Europe, wa wants more than anything to, well, to impress her, but also to collapse the distance that he would have, so four days back and forth to, say, Paris where she was much of the time. And so you have these kind of pressure to make this thing take off on October 4th, 1930, which it should not have done. And uh, uh, the book goes into a lot of detail about w why, th why this was such a bad idea to fly her so, so soon. And the last thing, I can talk more. I, I can ask more questions. <laughs> but the last thing I want to make sure we get in as I watch Lisa walking up the aisle. The hook, I see the hook is coming. Um, in the book, it talks about the spectacular miscalculation. They go through all this, trying to figure out how to build these things, trying to figure out how to fly these things. How do we get to India and back? How do we make this all work? They get to the point where it's supposed to happen and they're calculating the weight of the balloon and what it's going to carry and how much fuel that implies they have room to carry. And it's not enough. You can't carry enough fuel to take you where, where you want to go. How, how do you go through all of this and get to the point where you, somebody says, wait a second, this doesn't work? It was a, it was a series of mistakes, as I chronicle it. It's a, it's a book about sort of this management failure in another level, but yeah, the, the, when they first did it, they, the thing ended up being 23 tons heavy, which is a lot. And so they figured out that the only way they could fly it to India was if they broke it in half and stuck a, a, a literally t a, one of those 10-story gas bags in there and then put it back together again, which they did, which completely changed the aerodynamic characteristics of it. And then they tested it for only 16 hours in fair weather and then took off for India. Uh, so it was... Uh, Anyway, and I wanted to mention to you, I mean, I am, I have not been talking about the crash because that is kind of a spoiler. I mean, but the crash is one of the most interesting parts of the book, I think, and, and I've got great sources because there were six survivors and we actually have some moment by moment what happened. Uh, and I won't, I mean, you have to read it to get there, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's actually a, a spectacular thing it's a tragic thing. It was the largest outpouring of grief in Britain since the Titanic. I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of London and full funerals at Whitehall, uh, at uh, w uh, Westminster and St. Paul's. And um, it was one of the biggest, uh, it, was, it was the first, one of the first mass media events in world history. I mean, there's a lot going on there too. And you talk about the outpouring of, of grief. Uh, it's pointed out in the book, um, might not have the number right, but something like 800,000 people died, uh, British died in World War I, and that did not get the same sort of reaction that the people who died on, on this got. There was something about, right, that you, this was a, there was something kind of colossal about the ambition. There was something, it, this worked for von Zeppelin too. There was something about them that tugged at the national sense of nationhood and pride and there was something about it. Um, the, the grief was just exceptional. I mean, it's been forgotten now, but it was absolutely exceptional. So, Lisa, I'm guessing you want us to go to questions now. Okay, you, you, you pick them. Commissioner Nick? 
Uh, no. He is related to, uh, on both sides of his family, just generations back of the military elite of India is, what, is who he's related to. And his, uh, his cousin was the British military commander at Gallipoli. I mean, so, and th th they were military, they, they were kind of a big deal family in, in Indian history, part of the Raj. Over here. There was so there was a there was a pilot a main pilot and the the two critical people were what they call the coxswains and one was a was the kind of coxswain who who controlled whether the ship went kind of left or right but the more critical coxswain was stood sideways you know you were and his job was was dictating whether up and down so you had two different wheels two different guys and the main pilot kind of ran them. Um, and the height, these things, it, the height coxswain was just, it was, it was a constant struggle to get, because these things porpoised as they flew, they were very, they were difficult, unmanageable in wind. Um, and so these coxswains were constantly working against the wind, working against all this variable lift and everything. They were very, very difficult to fly. And, uh, and those, but those were the three main people in them. And they would work on, you know, then uh, uh, I guess they were on what, three shifts? Well, more than that. But anyway, th when the shift changed, those three would change. And they just went, you know, th that's how it went. But it, it was, uh, I mean, we know who was who was at the helm, if you will, when it went down. You know, a couple. So this airship, uh, this is curious because I in its trials, so this airship went up. There were two phases here. It went up in a series of trials where it flew out of north of London and it would go fly around, you know, go out in the English Channel, the North Sea, and come back. And I don't think it ever flew for more than a, a few days, like 40, 40 hours. I don't think it ever flew for longer than that. These were relatively short trips. Um, but because you, you, an airship could go up and do that, a, a plane couldn't fly for 24 hours, uh, but an airship, you know, they fly up, go around, lay off the coast for a while, and come back down is one of the things, you know. At, at their best, they were these wonderful kind of things that floated, and, and they were, you know, they were easy to travel on, and they weren't noisy and dirty or anything else, but they, so, so that on the night that our 101 took off for India, w she was minimally tested, but she only lasted seven hours, so. You know, a couple of interesting details on the controlling of the, of the ship. You know, you talked about the one standing sideways. Uh, they, they stood sideways because that's how they had to, to be to get a feel of what was happening in, in the airship. And something I thought was really interesting, sometimes the things that they would do, they needed 10 minutes to get the feedback on what happened from the change that, that we just made. You know, so not like, like being in your car, you turn the wheel, the car, the car turns, but th they didn't have that sort of uh, f feedback on their actions. You had something? Okay. Yes. It's mostly so. Uh, it, it's uh, it's mostly that I look for a good story. So I'm, you know, if there's different types of historians. I mean, there's a type of historian that you know has been at Oklahoma State University for 30 years and specializes in uh, you know uh, late medieval England, and that's the field, and that's what he or she knows, and that's kind of you know that that it's a specialization that kind of comes with the territory of academia. I'm a journalist, and a ju what a journalist has, among other things, is a, the attention span of a gnat, basically. I mean, <laughs> it's like you're, so you write your story, and then it's at the bottom of somebody's birdcage on Monday, and then you move on with your life, you know? It's, uh, and, and it corresponds to me. I, I, I have interest. So I, I, with the football story, I thought I had one of the great untold football stories that ever. I'm going to do it. Uh, you know, I, this absolutely is one of the great untold it, aviation stories. So I kind of go with what I think, what I'm interested in, and and uh, and and I'm, I feel very lucky that I had the lot the the uh, 
the, the freedom and the luxury to do it. Um, because if I, w if I had gone into academia and I were at Oklahoma State University, I'd be still writing about medieval England. Uh, I don't want to say that all academics are that narrow, but in, in my field, um, I mean, so it was interesting. One of the reasons I, I, I had what, what my, my first, or it was my third book, but my first book as a kind of a historian that I am now was, it was about the Comanche Indians and the founding of Texas called Empire of the Summer Moon. And it became a big national bestseller, and, uh, which is great. And, but one of the things it does is it opens a window, however briefly, where by the next book I can sort of do what I want to do um, because I'm successful. And so I looked around, and you know, I was a Civil War newbie. I didn't. I'm, I was a Civil War. I was like a fanboy. I read books, but I didn't. Uh, I wasn't a scholar of the Civil War. And I convinced him to let me do Stonewall Jackson, <laughs> which I sort of regretted a little bit later. <laughs> but it took so long to do. And when you are a newbie, you have to read everything. Uh, but I, I did it because it was the best story uh, that I knew, and I would have wanted to do that for 30 years. A book like that, and I did it because I could. Um, but yeah, I just it jumps around. It's uh, Indians to Civil War. I did spend in the middle of that time period seven or almost eight years on the Civil War, so that I did become a kind of a little bit smart about that. Lisa. Never, never, never heard it. Um, yeah, I mean, these th these things were powered by, in R101's case, five engines slung beneath the, the big envelope with big propellers on them, each 650 horsepower diesels. Uh, they, s you know, they, they did break down all the time, but I never, I never heard that they, they hit birds. <laughs> yeah, or the birds hit them, yeah. Yeah, that reminds me of one thing we didn't g get to Almost everything, when we're talking about the people, was inside of, of the airship. You had the engines on the outside. And that included a smoking room. <laughs> smoking room. <laughs> they, they figured out on the trip across the Atlantic with R34 in 1919, it was what it, everybody smoked. I mean, all those guys smoked. And it was this horrible deprivation to be, to have to go for, you know, three or four days without smoking, particularly after meals. They just hated it, and they couldn't do anything about it because there was no, I mean, you weren't even allowed a match on board. Um, so when they built R101, they not only built a, 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 ver a plush lounge and a, a, a fancy dining room and various, and a promenade, and windowed promenade and all these things, but they also, uh, they put in the smoking lounge, and they, and they put, you know, lined it with asbestos, and uh, and there was something uh, kind of thrilling, I think, about you know just above the S just above the smoking room was 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen. So it's kind of kind of billowing up there, and you're down there having a nice smoke. But no reason to worry. Yeah, hey. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. There's no danger. It was a different ethic in a different time. It was, there was a wartime, you know, we came out of wartime, but the, the people's idea of danger is just not what it, I mean, now we live in this kind of cosseted, sort of sheltered world now, but I mean, out of that w was, there was so much primitive technology. Anybody who even flew a plane was taking his life in his hand when he took off, or fly, or, 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 or any, th any kind of wartime or military equipment. I think there was just a, somebody wrote this, and I, I quoted at one point in my book, a comment about that that it was that it was just just a different standard of risk these guys you know there were especially the british raf types and these guys were british raf types it was like you know um uh what was their you know the uh well to the stars with difficulty uh it was their whatever but it's uh but but the informal motto was press on regardless was, you know, you were supposed to get up there and you weren't supposed to turn around. Nowadays, a pilot would be, you know, th the quote was the pilot would now be kind of patted on the back for not taking a risk and not, you know, crashing the plane and turn around, be safe and go home. He said after in World War One or beyond, you would be, that would be, you'd be thrown out of the service for it. I mean, you were expected to press on into something. And that's the, the best I can come up with because these guys, I uh, but they were, 
they were facing phenomenal danger all the time. There another character in this book that we didn't get to uh, named Scott, and that Scott. idea of press on regardless was uh, very closely tied with him, which caused a few problems along the way. You can read that in the book. <laughs> Anybody else? One, one over no? there. Okay, I missed the last part. Need a mathemati mathematician for. You mean of, of lift and variable lift and all that sort of thing? Um, they did. They they knew how to they knew how to calculate. It was amazing how good they were at actually knowing that they had variometers that measured this and inclinometers and all these kind of ometers and 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 they they really were pretty good at that at understanding the. Uh, if you looked at the, the cockpit of R101, it's just full of gauges, gauges everywhere. And they were, they were looking at them, and they were pretty good at that. Um, and the better ones, the Germans, were really good at that. Um, and flying through adversity and figuring out what to do. And um, uh, some of it was real seat of the pants stuff. At one point, you know, Scott, who was the guy who piloted that incredible crossing in 1919, at some point, you know, he's, he was his airship was uh, the victim of what they called superheating, which suddenly the gas inside the thing is way too hot compared to the gas outside, and the airship says he goes crazy and they take off. And he flew it into a wet cloud bank, <laughs> you know. Scott, who also used like spit and chewing gum to fix stuff. I mean, these guys were heroes in that old sense. You know, and your question, and another interesting detail, I think, is uh, how high you are is really Im important. You know, it matters to the questions of lift, but also if you're only 100 feet off the ground, you want to make sure that, that you know that. They had altimeters, but they weren't very sophisticated or, or reliable. And you talk about two other things that they did to check um, how high they were. They would f f fire blank cartridges at the ground, and sometimes they would drop bottles uh, to uh, tell them how that worked. No, it was uh, it was how trying to determine how high you were, and the the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, aneroid altimeter had only been invented the year before, and it was it was a barometer really. It just measured the distance dif difference in pressure, and and translated that um, to altitude. Um, but these things didn't work that well. So what the Germans used were were the there was a thing called an echolo, which was the gun right that they would fire at the ground and wait for the sound to bounce up to measure the time, <laughs> and then there was the dropping of the bottles. Uh, which again, you would hear it, or you would see it hit the water, if it was wa water in this case, and then you would again sort of measure the time and distance, and that somehow, but it, these things were so so primitive. <laughs> I mean, compared to what happened later. And hopefully, there's nobody underneath that bottle. <laughs> yeah. <is it? laughs> Anybody else? Yep. Yeah. Very good question. So it. It, these days in my business, I think ideas are the coin of the realm. And coming up with an idea that is, that is one, something that someone hasn't done either mostly just recently, but I mean basically an area that hasn't been overexplored over the years um, is, is, is a very big deal. And also one that can be done, you know, and, uh, and, and, some, and when you see an idea that's good, you see all the, these days people, writers sitting at their desks, no matter where they are, they're, they're plugged into the whole world of, of the internet and information. They can scour the world for ideas, who did what, when, where, and it's, it, it, it. So for example, there's a new book out, David Grant ha has done a book, who, who's a fine writer whom I've met, has a book called The Wager about a, uh, a uh, shipwreck in the 18th century. And it's great, you know, it's in really interesting. I mean, I'm starting to read it. And um, I just went, I'm curious, because it's such a great story. And I thought, wow, you, David got this story and nobody else ever found this story, even in this internet age that we live in, you know, nobody got that story. Well, okay, book published in tw tw 2014, 2016, 2018, 2019, 2021. These were all books, three of them were major. So this is the risk. Okay, so in this case, I'm the only one who's got that. At least I think. <laughs> so if you read a review in the New York Times tomorrow of the other book about R101, I'll be very disappointed. But 
the, the, there's a reason for that. So I read this. There's this wonderful British historian named James Morris who became a trans, I guess, person. It became Jan Morris at some point. However, writing as James, uh, he wrote a in just a flat, brilliant history. If any of you are interested in histories of the British Empire, it's just brilliant. Three volumes it's called Pax Britannica. The third volume is Farewell to Trumpets. It's about the 20th century and the British Empire is kind of breaking up. So right in the middle, and, and, it, and it was all looking at the, all these things I've talked about was the empire is kind of in trouble and the British is losing its technolo technological leadership and it's this kind of moment in time and there's this little three page section in there and this R101. I go, I go, that sounds like the greatest story. What a great story is my reaction to this. And this is years ago, reading the, the Morris book. And uh, in fact, I, well, at some point I, I became, I said, okay, well, I'll just go see how many books have been done about this. So I do what highly trained historians do is I Googled it. And <laughs> and I found out very, or I Amazoned it. I'm sorry, it was like I Amazoned it. But, uh, you know, well, there's really nothing. I mean, there was a book written in 82, but it was not really written by a professional writer. And all the stuff since has been just not worth anything. And, and so no, I mean, I had an open field to run in. And the reason is, I've concluded, because I, uh, I've talked to enough people about this that I don't think people read James Morris, Jan Morris anymore. I just don't think the British writer of the 20th century, of kind of the latter 20th century, I don't think people read that anymore. So I got lucky. I read it. I saw it. I found it. And I, well, I went, and I mainly I thought, what a great idea, and that I had a clear field to run in. And there weren't 10 books or 20 books or, you know, and there weren't. So you imagine my happiness <laughs> <laughs> at finding an idea, because it's getting harder in my business, let me tell you, to find something that, you know, uh, there's so many people now seem to be like, well, I'll just do a biography of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, oh yeah, great. That's just, you know, or, or, or Ulysses S. Grant, of, of which there have been 680 biographies. You know. Yeah, we really need another one, Sam, and you know, why don't you go do that for the next four years? Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's an important thing in what I do and how I decide on what I do. And I'm also, I should say, I wrote a biography of Stonewall Jackson. I don't think I was the first person ever to write about Stonewall Jackson. That's just a guess. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any announcements, Lisa? <laughs> you know, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I'm at a point where I don't have, in, in I published, I think, five books now in 12 years. And so I've been very busy uh, with, you know, just kind of, you know, as I finish one book, I go into the next book. And, and it's been fine. I don't really have one that compels me right now. Although there is, I, I, I have an idea of a next project, which is completely weird, and I would probably be making a huge mistake, and I don't even know why I'm sharing it with you guys, but in my book, Hymns of the Republic, and also in, uh, it, there's a character named Clara Barton, who you all probably know. I'd be surprised if you don't know who Car Clara Barton is. And I think we all, she's one of the most famous American women, uh, certainly of the 19th century, one, one of the absolute most famous women of the 19th century. She is known as the person who founded the American Red Cross. And even more important, she expanded its sort of mission from just battlefield help to disaster relief. And so Clara Barton's a big deal. But what people don't know is her role in the Civil War, uh, which was heroic. She's one of the great heroes of the American Civil War. And so I, there's this moment where she goes to the Battle of Antietam and is just, is just one of the great heroes of this battle, not with a gun in her hands, even though it's what she really wanted to do, um, but saving people in a field hospital. And I can't, I thought, you know, should I just write a book about that? But then I don't really know if it's a book. And I thought, no, it, I think it might be a screenplay. So I think I'm going to write a screenplay about Clara Barton. And you uh, heard it here. And I'm going to send it to uh, Jessica Chastain, and she's going to love it, and that'll be that. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Seriously. Okay, well, thank you, Sam. It was thank you very for a wonderful moderation. Now that's great. <laughs>